but representing the Australian Labor Party, please welcome Lily D'Ambrosio and Lisa Neville. And for those keeping score, Lisa has taken to the it's stage. stage yes. <laughs> Does that technology work? Yes? Oh, good. Um, yeah, so I'm Lisa Neville. I'm the Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. I'm also the member for Bellarine, so I have a seat that's... Uh, uh, very much uh, at the forefront of some of the issues that we're talking about today in terms of uh, climate change, sea level rises, wetlands, uh, I must say perhaps one of the most beautiful areas in Victoria. Um, who said here, here? Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, can I also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we meet on tonight and pay my respects to elders past and present? I also want to acknowledge uh, in the audience we have, uh, in fact, one of our candidates, um, from Q the candidate for Q, uh, who's running for the Labor Party, James uh, Gaffey, and uh, K he's here in order to take any difficult questions. So <laughs> Lily and I are only going to do the easy ones and James will do all the hard ones because he's, he's running and hope hoping to win the seat of Q, which might be a bit of an uphill battle, James, but it's great that, uh, that you're here with us tonight. Um, uh, apparently the Minister, uh, although he isn't doing one of the environment um, debates, he is actually <coughs> attending uh, one of the industry waste debates and as I often say, he is definitely the Minister for Rubbish and uh, as Lily added tonight, uh, a, wa <laughs> a waste of a Minister is what, what you might say. And uh, look, I, I do want to just go a bit over the last four years because I think it, it is a good starting point in terms of what we would need to do if we did win government in, uh, in 67 days or, in fact, as I also am reminded of, Victorians start to vote in 52 days uh, with early voting. So, uh, And given early voting is such a big thing now, it really is the election starts from then. Um, but, look, almost four years ago... Uh, Right to this point, the, the uh, current government promised an a environment policy. Right up until the election night, they were promising an environment policy, and that never happened. And I think that was probably the start of concerns about what that meant for the environment in Victoria. I think probably at the time, everyone thought Mary Woolridge, maybe she wasn't too bad. She'd said some of the good messages during her time as the Shadow Environment Minister. But um, as it turned out, Mary was not the minister. And in fact, we, what we were left with was a pretty toothless minister. In fact, a minister that pretty much has subcontracted the environment to the National Party. There's no doubt in my mind that the National Party are running the environment agenda here in Victoria. And certainly Peter Walsh is running that agenda through um, the primary industries component of the department. Now, I don't want to let the Liberals off the hook, and um, they've, they've signed up to that. They absolutely signed up to the policy directions in relation to the, to the environment, and certainly we're seeing a, replay, a repeat of that at a federal level, which um, will not only you know, reinforce the direction that we've seen in Victoria over the last four years, but entrench and make that, um, that direction worse. I think, as Mark said, um, it, it has not been a ca just a case of four years of not doing anything in the environment. It has been four years in which this government has taken us backwards in relation to the environment, um, backwards in relation to protections and enhancements of, of um, envir the environmental issues, whether it's climate change, whether it's energy, whether it's um, natural environment, whether it's about our coastal or marine management. And, in fact, I think the, the government's record would be, in my view, worse than um, probably since the Balti days. And in fact, it is the only government, Victorian government, since Balti that has not established a national park in its term. And I don't think they're going to establish one between now and uh, the 29th of November. And as I was saying, it is hard not to touch on that record and what they've done in the four years because it is a starting point in terms of some of the immediate priorities that we need to tackle um, if we were elected to government. Um, in addition to that, I will tonight talk about those areas where we have made specific commitments already in relation to the environment and climate change, but there will be some other areas that I won't be able to give you a definitive answer on. I'll talk about some of the principles and some of our thinking because, as Mark said, there is still a fair bit of time, oh, it's pretty close, but a fair bit of time where we will be uh, making some judgments about when the right time it is to make particular environment announcements. Rest assured, I'm not doing a Mary Woolridge and saying we're going to have a policy and we won't. We will absolutely have an environment policy and some of that will be outlined tonight. 
So if we, and, and Lily will particularly talk tonight around the renewable um, and, and energy efficiency side of the, the policy that um, we're in the process of developing. So let's just have a look at this government. So their first act, their first act was to put cattle back in the Alpine National Park. And that was, I think, a very deliberate decision and really a very important starting point for this government. That is, it said, absolutely, the National Party are in control. Special interests in this area were going to run the environment um, and, the, and the cattle were going back in. And they have fought tooth and nail to have that, that cattle back in, that, in the Alpine National Park. They went through legal court cases. They fought the federal government. Um, they lost all of that. Now we're back to having a trial, which has been approved by Greg Hunt. A trial in an area, in fact, that Parks Victoria, who has no money, Parks Victoria spent quite a lot of money rehabilitating the area that the cattle uh, will, now be, will now be sent into for the trial and, and wreck that particular area. So it was a very strong message, I think, to Victorians that we, you know, this is what we think about the environment and this is what we think about national parks. We have a situation where things like wind farms are almost impossible to build in Victoria. The industry is pretty much dead. Um, and, you know, we're nowhere near meeting a target that South Australian had because we have no industry. People have walked away from Victoria because it's impossible to put in place wind farms. We've got a Climate Change Act that... Um, that has no teeth, that has no focus, has no money, has no staff, no policy capacity to implement any of that Climate Change Act. Um, we've got rid of water saving targets. We've got rid of the EREP, which was the program that was so successful with some of our larger businesses to reduce energy and water <coughs> use in Victoria. We've seen the defunding of environment groups and other cuts to other groups. We've seen Sustainability Victoria basically become an organisation that manages waste um, and the waste policy in the state. Uh, we've allowed free-for-all firewood collection in our national parks. We've seen the laying of groundwork to allow mining um, and potentially logging back in certain state parks like the Wombat State Forest. We've got debate occurring now. If you sit down and talk to any of the forest industry, we've got debate occurring. Uh, they're trying to raise it with us, but also with the government, about whether we should rethink whether national parks have worked and whether we should reopen national parks to, to logging in the future. We've seen uh, uh, the government uh, put an inquiry out to the VIAC, uh, to VIAC uh, about prospecting in national parks. Uh, that VIAC basically wrote a scathing report about the impact of prospecting in national parks, but because of the terms of reference, we're required to recommend additional national parks for prospecting. So again, a national party-driven policy. And of course, we've seen some of the worst possible native vegetation rules and regulations introduced into this state, where you know, Victoria cannot afford to lose any more native vegetation. We are the most cleared state in Australia um, and we have a situation where the new laws will see huge destruction of our native vegetation unless we can turn that around. We're seeing the opening up of national parks to 99-year leases and large-scale private development. We've seen huge job cuts in DEPI and, in fact, the majority of those job cuts have occurred in the environment side of DEPI. We've seen huge budget cuts mainly in environment and Parks Victoria. Parks Victoria is basically on its knees. Parks Victoria have no staff, no capacity to... You know, we've got um, our parks that are at risk of being closed because walking tracks can't be repaired, bridges can't be repaired. We, we know that in the uh, performance measures that are being set by the government around our assets in our coastal and park uh, areas, that, that they're only going to be at about 55 to 60 per cent in good condition. The rest are in poor condition. And that is just on a fast trajectory down. Um, we've also seen staff from Parks Victoria being diverted to collect camping fees in remote areas of our national parks and also seen them having to monitor firewood controls because, um, because they've got a free-for-all system where, um, where locals can no longer actually collect firewood. So this is just a brief bit of what they've done. And in fact, if you have a look at the Environment Victoria website, there's a whole other list of uh, things that have happened. But it is a very, very bad record. And as I said, in my judgment, perhaps one of the worst governments in relation to the environment since the Bolte government. So where are we going? So let's have a bit of a talk about land and conservation management. 
So the Victorian Labor Party and um, Victorian Labor opposition see land and <coughs> conservation management as an absolutely key state responsibility. And we want to be a leader, again, in conservation policy. We will put in place a blueprint for a natural Victoria, which will look at new legislation, it will look at new institutions, and it will look at new program delivery. Now, that, you know, I, I won't outline in detail because that will sit within our policy, but it will look at all of those factors and how we strengthen, how we better protect habitats, how we improve our ecosystems, how we look at biodiversity, um, or, in fact, I think we need another word for biodiversity. Um, but natural Victoria, perhaps, or conservation, land conservation. Some of the commitments that we've already made, um, and, and as I said, we'll say more closer to the election. We will remove cattle again from Alpine National Park. Um, however, we have to do that. Well, last time we did it by legislation, and we'll do that again. And that will perhaps be one of our first acts. We will not reopen national parks to logging or mining. We will not allow 99-year leases or large-scale private development in our national parks. In fact, as of today, we have said that we do not support the current proposal for the Point, Point Nepean um, uh, development. Now, for those who follow um, what's happening in terms of private development in national parks, this is proposed to be a, well, in fact, it's pretty hard to tell exactly what's proposed, but it is quite a large-scale development that's being proposed way beyond the footprint and also the master plan that was approved in 2010 by the local community. It will provide for a 99-year lease to a private operator. The community have had limited say um, only on the concept plans, not on detailed plans. The community will not be involved further in relation to that development. So potentially before the election, the government can approve a 99-year lease to a private development for a pretty unknown, in terms of detail, development on that point in the PM. Whereas we are not supporting it, we are calling on the government not to sign the lease, and as we understand it, it is a disallowable instrument that will come before the parliament, um, and if we are in government, we will oppose um, that, dis that, um, that amendment to enable the Point Nepean development to occur in its current forms, and we will work in partnership with the community, as we did back in 2009 and 10, to get a better outcome over there. Um, we're also looking at opportunities at the moment to further expand our national park reserves and that will be something that we will have much more to say on as we get closer to the election. We will, as I said, you know, uh, Victoria is the most cleared state, so our national park, the ability to expand and increase and protect our national parks is perhaps more important here than anywhere else in Australia. We will also review and uh, change the current uh, native vegetation rules that have been put in place. Last week, um, uh, we also announced a new state park in Ballarat, the Canadian State Park, which is the old plantation land which um, the government was going to sell, which will be rehabilitated and protected for that community. We've also announced new protections to uh, at Hanging Rock to ensure that the development that was proposed by the local council there cannot go ahead, so that will be both a mixture of planning laws, environmental laws and new management arrangements to protect Hanging Rock. In relation to climate change, um, and some of the, I suppose, the initiatives will, that will sit under this will obvi obviously go to the issue of renewable energy and, uh, and Lily will be talking a bit more about that. But can I make it clear that we absolutely believe that climate change continues to be one of the most critical issues facing Victoria and Australia, and that a state government can and must play a leadership role in assisting in mitigating risks and adaptation. We want to ensure that Victoria is a leading state. We want to lead. We have a federal government that is walking away from action in this space, and we want to play a leadership role in shifting community debate again and seeing um, real action on climate change in Victoria, but also trying to play a leadership role nationally. We will look at this through things like an emissions reduction target again, which Victoria had, um, and we will, um, we will work with the community around that target. We will look at you know, energy efficiency measures. Um, we talk about you know, the, the opportunities around green jobs, and there will be much more to say in that space as well. 
looking at opportunities through government buildings um, that we're, and investments that we're making, so money that we're investing in schools and hospitals, etc. what opportunities there are to drive um, energy efficiency measures in that, that both have a cost saving to the state, but also actually play a leading role in, um, in energy efficiency. And we will also look again at the role of Sustainability Victoria, um, from not just being some, an organisation that's looking at waste management, but actually a role, a leadership role they can play around climate change, around supporting communities, and also around energy efficiency leadership. We'll also need to have a look again at the planning rules that apply, particularly for coastal communities, and how we adapt and respond to sea level rises. I know, for example, um, and I think this is in a number of councils across Victoria, uh, but certainly in the city of Greater Geelong and the borough of Queenscliff, and if anyone's been to Queenscliff, um, uh, they could float away. Uh, so there are some real challenges in, uh, in, in those communities about responding to sea level rises and some reports that they were funded to do, uh, looking at this and the risks and the, need, and the need for action, have been completed, but they're too scared to put it out because it's so bad, <laughs> the results are so bad, and the government are, are not willing to provide any support to assist them in looking at real mitigation um, uh, responses to, at the same time as releasing those reports. So we know that there is a there is significant work that we need to do in supporting those councils in relation to sea level and those communities in relation to sea level rises, as well as you know how do we best protect our our foreshores, etc. Which brings me on to the area of marine and coastal rivers and bay areas. And as I said, I'm very lucky. I have a I think my seat has the most coastline of any seat in Victoria. Um, which has proved to also be very difficult because with the redistribution I now have the most marginal uh, ALP held seat, so because uh, we can only go, the boundary could only go one way. So, um, so I picked up another coastal town. So um, uh, Barn Heads, and you may have heard about the Barn Heads Bridge, which is still a talking point in, in that community. Um, but look, yeah, Victoria is extremely lucky. I don't think Victorians, I, I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say that. We are extremely lucky. We have perhaps one of the most unique marine environments um, anywhere in the world. I think we do, we are comparable to the Great Barrier Reef and in fact given uh, uh, climate change, I think we probably are even uh, moving ahead in terms of um, what, what we have on offer in terms of our marine environment. But we have a lot of pressures here as well. It's not just the Great Barrier Reef that's under pressure. We have a lot of pressure from climate change. We have a lot of pressure from erosion and pollution, and we've also seen, as I said, significant funding cuts that has meant that a lot of our coastal and marine assets have been allowed to deteriorate over that period of time. Um, marine parks have been absolutely critical, I think, have played a really important role in protecting our marine environment, and we do have to get better at managing those marine parks, and, um, and we're certainly... Um, looking at the, the Auditor General's report, was it Auditor General, VX reporting to marine parks and how we best do that. But I certainly also know that um, the Recreational Fishing Organisation is out there saying we should reopen marine parks to fishing and uh, we have said clearly to them that is not going to happen. Marine parks will not be reopened to recreational fishing. And I think if you spend any time with the rec fishing people in my electorate, in, in the end most would admit that there is actually more fish now to catch um, because of those marine parks um, providing a real breeding ground for fish. Um, so we need to celebrate them and we need to manage them better. And we have to do better in our management of our coast and our bays and our, and our rivers as well. So as I said, we've got some really big challenges as a result of climate change, of erosion and pollution. So if we look at the Yarra River, for example, and I'm not about to uh, announce uh, today our policy, but other than to say that uh, we are looking at both myself, Brian T as planning, and also Mark Foley as the water uh, shadow, uh, a comprehensive plan, I suppose, but across the three portfolios to look at how we can work together and actually protect the Yarra and strengthen the Yarra and improve the Yarra. So hopefully, uh, well, it was your idea, Ian, yeah. so... Yeah. <laughs> so, in opposition, we've, we've relied a lot on um, lo local community groups to assist us in developing policy ideas. Similarly, with issues around riparian land, uh, Martin Foley and myself are working together. We know this is both a critical health and environmental issue, how we protect um, 
uh, our rivers from um, the damage that's done by cattle, both as I said, both in a health and environmental way. And again, we're trying to come up with a through assistance from Environment Victoria, but also across um, the water and environment portfolio, a policy that we will be able to take to the election that hopefully will meet um, the issues that have been raised. In relation to marine and uh, the other thing I'd say in relation to marine and coastal and bay issues is that we are looking at a new management and oversight arrangements. And again, that's something that we will announce closer to the election. Um, that will be done through legislative options looking at how we measure quality, how we report to the community about that and how we strengthen the information back to the community about the state of our coasts and bays uh, that then informs uh, how we better manage tho those very important assets. Um, we will also be looking at new strategies to enhance and protect our coasts, particularly um, from erosion and sea level rises. So. Um, so I will leave it there, I'm sure you'll have some questions, but what I would say is that the environment up until uh, this government, well, certainly the last few, environment has been a very senior position in government. It has been a senior minister, um, in fact at one point uh, John Thwaites, who is also Deputy um, Premier, was the environment minister. So it is and should be a senior position within government and within the Cabinet, and we want it to again be a senior position in government. And we want to not just reverse the damage, and there's a lot to reverse, but actually to take significant step forward in relation to um, land and conservation management, in relation to coastal, marine, bays and waterways, um, and in providing real leadership and action in relation to climate change. This is a very, in my view, a very, very important election. There is a lot at stake. We have a federal government that has walked away from really any responsibility in relation to the environment. We have a state government that has already shown its colours in relation to the environment. And I don't think that's going to change. I really don't think that will change. I think it will continue to be something that's led by the National Party here in Victoria. So it is a critical uh, fight, this election, and it's a very critical fight to, to protect and enhance Victoria's environment. So I'm, so I'm urging you to think carefully at this election about who is going to be best place to stand up and fight for the environment. And in the end, there will be a government which will be a Liberal National Government or a Labor Government. So thank you for your time today. And um, I'll ask Lily to um, um, come and uh, present on renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to join with you uh, here tonight and I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're having uh, this forum on and uh, I certainly wish to pay my respects to uh, all elders uh, past and present. And I do like to start from the, the, the point of, of Mark's, uh, I think Mike's, uh, one of Mark's last comments and that is well how much really changes. Well I don't think we need to go very far to realise that a hell of a lot changed from uh, the election campaign period of 2010 and what we actually got from this government in terms of policy uh, and renewable energy policy uh, at that. And uh, we only have to look at the fact that uh, the previous Labor government uh, built up a whole set of credibilities, if you like, in terms of uh, actions to take us to a cleaner uh, energy future, uh, growing the jobs and, and putting out there very clearly what our roadmap was to, to have a greater share, to gain a greater share of renewable energy. Uh, what we had, of course, though, was uh, the main competitor, the, the Liberal and Nationals, basically saying, me too, me too. Well, uh, when we all woke up uh, the next morning and we got the election results, it was very, very soon after that that we started to realise that the government was basically uh, deciding to throw all of that out and actually did a massive U-turn uh, on almost every front, in fact, every renewable energy and energy efficiency front that you could think of that had been built up by the previous Labor government. So that's, that's I suppose, a one direct response to that question, well, how much really changes? A hell of a lot changes. Uh, so if anyone thinks that this election, we're going to have the same question thrown up there, and, and by all means, ask the question, but I would say to you that we don't have to look very far back in history to show that a hell of a lot has changed 
uh, and uh, we need to think very carefully about what we need to do to actually get them changing back uh, so that we can actually continue on the road to actually growing our share of renewable energies uh, in terms of the demand side, but also looking at energy efficiency uh, and improving the uptake of energy efficiency measures, whether it's in the home or the business or in government buildings and departments, to actually try to shift away from uh, a highly uh, consumptive uh, energy uh, reliant uh, economy that, uh, that we've had up until now. So uh, if I can perhaps uh, put it this way, uh, the U-turn was uh, can easily be described as uh, taking, having taken Victoria from a position of uh, national leadership to, to one of basically uh, being a national laggard when it comes to renewable energy and energy efficiency. And I've mentioned some of the critical uh, threshold issues, but importantly, of course, is that we only have to look at the fact that very quickly uh, the uh, government uh, has basically uh, decided to relinquish um, its support for a target for solar energy, for example, and in fact a target for a broader renewable energy uh, frame. Uh, it uh, said that it was going to grow the energy efficiency scheme, the, the BEAT scheme. Uh, they did that for a short bit and of course we now know that they've decided to axe it all together, putting 2,100 people, uh, people's jobs basically uh, out on their ear. Uh, we have also seen uh, many promises made in terms of uh, improved uh, uh, standards, if you like, to, to buildings in terms of energy efficiency, and they've all uh, disappeared. So, and of course, uh, the one that we knew was coming, or perhaps I've been a little bit harsh on, on them, but we did know that the, the terrible planning laws, which have basically uh, uh, shut the door on new planning approvals uh, for wind projects, we know that they, they did uh, deliver on that, so we have to probably give them a tick on that front. But I wouldn't give them a tick on anything else, and that's the reality. So when you look at the record of what we had uh, before the last state election, where we had a very clear roadmap and funding to actually achieve uh, a growing uh, share of our renewable energy uh, resources, uh, we've actually gone uh, fairly much backwards, uh, much to, to the despair of uh, many people in the community uh, who we know that there's continuing to be a greater um, support for renewable energies that come with it. Uh, now, uh, what's also very important, I think, for us to understand here is that we are probably at the most critical turning point in Victoria when it, when it comes to uh, transformative technologies. Uh, and, we are, and, and also where we are at in terms of transitioning from uh, old style, if you like, of, of uh, industry to the newer forms of industry. And, and when we talk about renewable energies and, and energy efficiency, we need to understand and see it in relation to that reality, uh, more so than other states, except possibly South Australia. We know, of course, that the auto industry, um, whatever people think about government support for it or whatever, the fact is it is uh, basically on its knees and will soon disappear in terms of auto manufacturing. Uh, there are a lot of engineering jobs in that, but do we actually have any conversation at all from this government, from this government to say, what do we do with those skills? What do we do with the skills, the engineering skills that are there now, when we know that when we know that renewable energy and the technologies that go with that, that complement that, uh, are very reliant on high skills, on engineering skills. Uh, for example, uh, I visited solar systems in Abbotsford, and, and it is unfortunate that their Mildura project uh, has been abandoned, but nevertheless, 18 months ago when I visited that place uh, and had a tour of their assembly plant, uh, there were still platforms for the solar panels uh, that were lying about. And my question was, well, where did they come from? Who made them? And the answer was a small manufacturing business, an engineering firm in Ballarat, a firm uh, that essentially had been relying on car manufacturing, auto manufacturing, to, to run their business and, and to make a living. And they understood that things were looking shaky for the industry and that they needed to diversify and they did that, and they did that with, with those solar platforms. And a really important story, uh, and it's those types of opportunities that are here right now, and we've got a government that is refusing to acknowledge those opportunities, and very soon we're going to be confronted with an ever-increasing, a, a, 
a more rapidly increasing jobs crisis in Victoria, a training crisis, uh, and uh, I don't want to necessarily just talk about renewable energies in terms of jobs, but it goes together and it makes sense. And I think when we start to have the conversation about what types of things can governments do uh, uh, with respect to renewable energies, having those conversations and having that vision of taking the challenges that we've got in front of us right now here in Victoria and seeing those challenges as opportunities, then that's what we are committed to do. Uh, and we have made it very clear, and we, we said this in 2012, uh, that uh, Dan Andrews' Labor government, we will have released before the election a renewable energy action plan. So we will have a lot more to say. We also said uh, uh, in 2012 that that would also include a response to the restrictive planning laws uh, that essentially close the door on, on new planning approvals for wind projects. So that's, that's a very important positioning for us and we are adamant and we are very much committed to growing Victoria's share of renewable energy, uh, making sure that we actually line that up with job opportunities and training opportunities, uh, because this is going to be our future. And we can either uh, hinder it, as the, national, as, as, uh, the NAPFINE government has, has done, and federally, of course, uh, but it is inevitable that the community has embraced the need for change, and the community knows that the change is a good thing. And we need governments with a vision to be able to work towards achieving that change. Uh, now, uh, I did mention uh, VEAT, which is an important one. We've already made a clear policy statement uh, that with the government axing the scheme, uh, and it's due uh, to uh, shut down by the end of 2015, uh, although it may actually have a, a much earlier end because the government has, to this date, refused to pass their legislation through the parliament, which sets a much lower target for next year. Uh, so without that legislation, we've actually got no target for next year. Uh, so the thing can just come to a screeching halt. But we've made it very clear that uh, if we're elected, we will restore VEAT, and the details of that, of course, will be uh, uh, fleshed out uh, publicly uh, before the election, and it's something that uh, we've remained very committed to as an important and effective tool, and it's actually world-renowned. So when we look at what Victoria did under the previous Labor government, we made some significant world-renowned breakthroughs, and VEAT is one of those schemes. VEAT is one of those schemes. The Victorian Renewable Energy Target, um, of course that morphed into the federal target, but you know, we went out there and nailed it. We, we nailed a legislated target for renewable energies, and we had a map, a road map to actually get us there. Now, there are difficulties, of course. There are challenges for a future uh, government, a uh, Labor government that wants to grow renewable energies and of course with the current federal renewable energy target uh, it does have a constitutional corporation's uh, power invoked uh, and a state immunity which basically makes it you know, impossible uh, for uh, state by, similar state-based schemes to be commenced. To, to, be, to, to get off the ground. So that is a real barrier. So whatever others may say on, in this space, uh, it is a real constitutional problem, but a creative government and a government with some vision and a commitment to growing renewable energies will find a way around that. And I know that, and, and hopefully you will come to know and appreciate it also before the election, that we'll be able to identify clearly how we are able to, how, what steps we will be taking to actually achieve that. So um, I um, also want to talk about um, uh, technologies uh, and what is really before us because we know that, uh, and I think I said this much earlier, that uh, with uh, the transformation of uh, industries in Victoria, we also need to have a look at energy as a very um, a highly charged, and excuse the pun, but in terms of uh, the innovation and the rapid uh, development of innovative uh, innovation in terms of the technologies, that uh, change will be very clear uh, and will be clearly moving towards uh, people not just generating their own electricity, either in their home or at a, a localised level, either through communities or workplaces, but will also be given the opportunities to actually store that energy and use it in ways uh, that really present or provide greater power. Uh, and, and, and if you like, democratise uh, our energy system. Uh, and that's very important for us to understand and see and work through ways that we can facilitate that rather than hinder that. And again, the job opportunities that are within that 
uh, are just enormous. Uh, so uh, that's something that, uh, if you like, I, I'm indicating that we have a very clear uh, interest in uh, and uh, we'll have, again, more to say on that. Uh, here in Victoria, uh, we've got the intellectual property with a lot of uh, technologies, solar cell technology. You have, have to have a look at my, um, Bio21 uh, over in uh, the precinct uh, near the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Uh, where you know they've been doing quite some some terrific work in uh, uh, micro organic solar cells that can actually be printed on film lightweight uh, that can just transform every single rooftop uh, in terms of the the ability to generate solar energy just from that um, and so we've got the intellectual property we've got to an extent good collaborative arrangements uh, but we need governments that actually recognise that and work towards that transformative phase, that innovation that uh, we need here in Victoria. Uh, without that, we're simply going to be left behind uh, and really we despair uh, about what vision, uh, if there is any, and, and I doubt that, that, uh, that this government is actually going to come up with and present uh, in this election coming up. So I would say to you, I would uh, put to you that this election will present very, very clear uh, uh, choice uh, in terms of renewable energy and energy efficiency and, and how we can actually have, you know, uh, households be able to get higher value uh, efficiencies in their home. There's going to be a very, very really stark choice uh, between the two major parties that inevitably it's one or the other that's going to form government. Uh, so I would ask you to think through those, uh, th think through those issues uh, and uh, see the challenges as great opportunities. Uh, by voting Labor, because that's what that's where it will happen. Thank you.